It was one of the longest days I've experienced in a long time. And not long because of the time that was put into it. I I spent a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, This was different because of the amount of energy and emotion and stress that was involved in this day. And I remember going from meeting to meeting, and in those meetings we were talking about the future and what was in store, and in those meetings there was conflict. As someone who isn't a big fan of conflict, this was stressful to me, it was hard. And even in those meetings, there were tears that were cried because of the pain and the frustration and the emotion that was involved in those. So as I left that day, I got into my car, and I had the thought as I sat in my car and took a deep breath, man, it'd be nice if I didn't have to deal with this anymore. So I had a furrowed brow and and had a scowl on my face, and I drove home, and I, I honestly just wanted to drive home and sit and do nothing. I don't want to talk to my family. I just want to sit there and and be frustrated. So 15 minutes later, I I pull up in front of our house. And before I get out of the car, I take a a deep breath. (sighs) Hop out of the car, close the door, and I walk up the driveway. And I approach our front door. Our front door is made out of wood. And I went to grab my keys that I have on the side of me. And as I grabbed them, they got caught in my pants, and I accidentally threw them in. They hit the front door. And it sounded like a a school janitor was walking down with how many keys that hit the front door. And in the frustration of the day, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I yelled at the top of my lungs, of course that would happen. Of course. As I walk up to the front door and pick up my keys, inside I hear very faintly the sound of a very soothing voice. And that was my wife. She said, hey kids, I think someone's home. And picking up my keys, I couldn't help but smirk. I'm home. So I grabbed my keys and I put the key into the door. And with our door, when you open it, we have a brick floor. And the, the door scrapes against the, uh, the brick and makes a loud noise, which is really a sign of, hey, someone is home. And so as I open the door, I grab my backpack and put it down, take two steps. And then at about 150 decibels, I hear three small voices yell at the top of their lungs. Dad! Dad's home! Dad is here! Dad! I'm sorry. Sorry. Exactly what it sounded like. And as I turn the corner, three beautiful kids come running down the hallway with steps as quick as possible on this, on this brick floor, bah, 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 running at me, and then like leeches they grab onto my legs. Dad, you're home! Dad, you're home! Dad, you're home! And in an instant, all the frustration and the emotion of the day went out the window, and I was home. And the hugs and looking in their faces and them saying, Dad, you're here. That never gets old. That never gets old. Now, if you're a parent in the room, maybe you've experienced that before. You've had frustrating days. Maybe you have great days, and you come home, and your kids yell, Dad, Mom, whatever it looks like, and it's one of the best feelings you could ever experience. And if you're not a parent in the room, maybe you remember as a kid putting your face up against the window and waiting for your parents to come home, and your face is just smashed. Dad's home, I think. Dad's home, right? And there's just so much, so much excitement for your parents to be here. And what I love about that moment when they said, Dad, is... His, my parents, they're in the last service, and I don't think they're in here, but my dad was sitting back there, and I, I just love my dad. But I didn't know what that title, dad, entailed until when? Until I became a dad. You just don't know. You have an idea. But I didn't understand it until I became dad, and quickly you, you learn that dad isn't just a title, but dad is a responsibility. Dad is an honor. Being a dad means you get to wrestle with your kids. If you're a dad, you like to wrestle with your kids. Uh, it's fun, and they laugh, and you get to tickle them. But being a dad also includes discipline. Personal discipline, but also discipline of your kids, which isn't always easy. Being a dad or a parent is frustrating sometimes. <laughs> when you have two-year-olds, ooh, goodness. But also being a dad is the most rewarding thing you'll ever be a part of. And what I quickly learned is that dad was not just the title, but it's an honor to be a dad. It's a responsibility to be a dad. And more than that, dad is part of my identity as a person. I can no longer never be a dad. I will always be a dad. It's a part of my identity. And the power of who I am to my kids has a lot of meaning to me. What I've learned is, and I'm still continuing to learn, because by no means am I a perfect parent, okay? None of us, our parenting is hard. But the more I become a parent and the more I learn that as I see what, how I could be a provider for my kids, I learn 
more about the character and the identity of who God is in my life as our Heavenly Father and how much, man, the times when I screw up, how much he still loves me and he cares for me. But all of that has come through me learning and understanding who he is. When I learn and who understand who he is, then I want to be a better dad for my kids. It's cyclical. And so today, we're going to talk about this whole idea of understanding the identity of God. Because when you learn about who God is, the more you're able to trust who he is. It's just like any relationship. You don't just jump into a relationship and, and get married on the whim, right? You, that does, that's not how it works. You want to know them. You want to trust them. I'm not going to hand my kids off to some babysitter I don't know. I want to be sure, like, you're a safe person, right? I want to trust you. And so that's the same idea with God. The more we know about him, hopefully it returns as trust, as what David writes in the psalm. He says, those who know your name, they trust in you. And so what does it look like to trust? Trust means like when you know you're trusting God, you're going to him in prayer. When you know you trust God, you're going to him first when things are frustrating. When you know you trust God, you see the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. That's an awful word. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All those things are coming out of our life. Why? Because you're trusting God. And so as we begin this series today, we're looking all at the identity. The series is called Here Now. We're looking at the identity of Jesus, God's son, because throughout the Gospel of John, which is where we're going to be for the next several weeks, and you should have outlines on your chairs, so you can take notes today. But the Gospel of John, Jesus makes seven statements about who he is, his identity, and we call them the I am statements. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at when Jesus said it in that time, what did it mean to the people 2,000 years ago? Now, let's take that. What does it mean to us in the here and now? That's the name of the series, here and now. And then most importantly, we can't just know what it means, but it's what is your response to what he actually said to those people and then to us, okay? And so that's the idea behind the series. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to John chapter 8, and that's where we're going to be today. John chapter 8, and uh, I'm just curious, how many of you in here, you're conflict avoiders? Conflict avoiders, raise your hand. Oh, look, at hey, that's fine. How many of you guys, you just love conflict? Let's put me in a fight. That's some of us. Yes, Mike Kuypers, I see the hand. Yeah, right? You're just like, let's go out there. John 8, as you're turning there, it's important to know the, the context of what's going on. John 8 uh, is all about conflict and where Jesus is at. He's in, a, he's in an argument, okay? And so if you don't like conflict, you would not have liked to have been Jesus in this moment, okay? And so John 8 starts with this lady that was caught in adultery. And so uh, Jesus and the religious leaders and the Jews were on the temple courts, and the religious leaders bring this woman in. They say, this woman was caught in adultery, and so the punishment of adultery in that time was you would actually get stoned to death, okay? And so they grab big old stones, and they would throw these stones at you until you're no longer breathing. And so they're about to punish this girl, but Jesus, he's off in the corner, and as you see it, he's, he's riding in the sand. He's not just drawing pictures, but, you know, there's a lot of speculation of what he was writing. He's writing, but then he intervenes, and he says, anyone who's without sin, you can cast the first stone. So the religious leaders with their stones are going, Okay, and it says one by one, they all backed away. And then Jesus talks to this lady who was caught in adultery and says, hey, go and leave your life of sin. So Jesus saves this woman's life, but then all the conflict that was focused on this woman who was caught in adultery now shifts to Jesus. And Jesus is about to explain his identity to the religious leaders and the Jews at the time. And they're not really having it. Okay? They, they understand the words that are coming out of his mouth, but they don't, they don't understand why he is the one saying it. Okay, and so where we are at right here is we're right in the middle of the conflict that is going on. Of Jesus explaining who he is, and the Jews and the religious leaders have, get a little frustrated with him, okay? But before we dive in, uh, let's pray that God would speak to us about, one, who he is and his identity and what our response is to that. And so pray with me. God, we're so thankful that you are our dad. We're thankful that you, one, you love us. God, you love us enough to send your son uh, so that we could have a relationship with him. And so, God, as we read your word, God, speak to us today. We know that your word has so much to say. God, I pray that we would not just take it for granted, but, God, that we would use it. We would use it as a tool for us to grow closer to you. And so, God, use it today. Speak through me, God, and whatever you have to say through me, God, that we would all continue to learn and grow uh, more about who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. All right, John 8 uh, says this. In verse 50, or 48, the Jews answered him. They said, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? All right, let's stop right here, okay? Um, if you know anything about the situation going on, Jews and Samaritans do not get along, okay? So Jesus is a Jew. Uh, he's talking to Jews and religious leaders who are Jews. And so if you were, to, if you were a Jew and he called another Jew a Samaritan, uh, that, was, that was harsh. Like we go, oh, that's, that's kind of mean. In this context, 
these are like fighting words, okay? Because Samaritans were seen as half-breeds. They're heretics. They didn't believe a lot of the Old Testament. And so as a Jew who followed the Old Testament and the law, they're like, how dare you? You can't do that. And so a Jew would spend their entire life avoiding a Samaritan. They did not like each other, okay? And so if I called you a Samaritan and you're a Jew, that is, one, a derogatory term, and it's also a, a racist term. So those are fighting words, okay? But more than that, they say, aren't you demon-possessed? which is almost more offensive because they're saying, the stuff you're doing is definitely not from God. That's from Satan, okay? So so there's tension here, but Jesus responds to them. He doesn't respond about the Samaritan part, but he responds to the the demon-possessed, and he says, I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word... He will never see death. Now, he's not saying you will never die, but he's saying you will see eternity in heaven. That's what he's saying. Verse 52, at this, the Jews exclaim, and they're getting riled up. Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus says in verse 54, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, and look what he says, whom you claim as your God. Now you have to remember that Judaism is monotheistic. They believe in the same God that we worship, okay? And so they're saying, yeah, we believe in that same God. So they're, just by the way they live their life, they're proclaiming that God is their God. But look what Jesus says. You claim it as your God, as the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. Ooh, But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And this is probably kind of a little joke that they say, and they're probably starting to laugh at Jesus. You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? (laughs) Good one, Jesus. And then Jesus silences the crowd. He says, I tell you the truth. And I want you, if you have a paper Bible, if you're highlighting, whatever, underline this next part that he says. Before Abraham was born, I am. Now in English, we read this and go, Jesus, you are what? You're hungry? You're thirsty? Like, well, I am. I don't know what you're saying. I am, okay? But in the context, they knew what was going on, and we'll get into it. And at this, look at the response of the Jews. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, and Jesus was a ninja. He hid himself, and he was slipping away from the temple grounds. So we're in the middle of this conflict right here, and you have to remember, Jesus is not just talking to religious leaders, but he's talking to Jews, which in verse 31, if you read, a lot of these Jews, it it says they believed in him, okay? And so how quickly things turned to, because of what Jesus was saying, it caused this conflict, something inside of him, because that can't be true, And so as we look at this, as we look at 2,000 years ago, when Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am, what did that mean to the people back then? Okay, and so that's where we're going to start with today. And like I said, you have those outlines, you can take notes. You can also go to newbreak.info if you want to download them, et cetera. Uh, But that name, I am, we have to understand that, first of all, I am is a title of deity, okay? So ultimately, Jesus was saying, I am God, Okay, that's what he's saying, which is a little confusing because, once again, they're monotheistic. They believe in one God, so by you saying you're human and you're God, that doesn't really work, okay? And this wasn't the first time that Jesus said it. If you go back a few verses as well, Jesus said in verse 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that, and here's that word, I am he, the same word, okay? And that I do nothing on my own, but I speak just what the Father has taught me, okay? And so to understand a little bit more about the context and the the verbiage he uses when he says, I am We have to go all the way back to the beginning and the first time we hear I am, and we have to go to Exodus. Now, you don't have to turn in your Bibles to Exodus, but we're Exodus chapter 3. We're just in a series called From Surviving to Thriving, and we looked at the story of the Israelites. You may remember this, and their leader was Moses. Uh, At one point, Moses, he actually hid from God for 40 years to become a shepherd, and he's like, I don't want anything to do with anyone, not even God. And then God blows up a bush, it's on fire, and Moses goes, oh, fire, let's walk towards it. And he gets closer to fire, which is always your first reaction, go to a fire. And he he goes to this fire, and the the fire starts talking to him, and it's God. And so God is ultimately telling Moses, hey, I want to use you, Moses. I want you to set my people free. I want you to take them from slavery, and I want you to deliver them to the promised land. And Moses is going, me? You want to use me? And God says, yeah, I want to use you. But Moses asks a question. He says, so... When I go to Egypt and I like set them free and they say, who sent you? What am I supposed to say? 
So then God responds to Moses in Exodus 3.14. And this is what he says, and this is the first time we hear that word, the name I am. And God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. I am has sent you. Now, this word I am, we would know it. Like you've probably heard the word, the term Yahweh. Have you heard that? Yahweh. Like this is the personal name of God. And when he says I am who I am in Hebrew, you would pronounce it Ehye Asher Ehye. Ehye Asher Ehye. Meaning I am who I am. When he talks to Moses, ultimately what he is saying to him in the context of that moment is Moses, I know this is going to be difficult, but I am the God who will be with you. That's the term, Yahweh, Eye Asher Eye. I am the God who is with you. I'm not only with you, but I'm going to be with the Israelites. I am the God who is with you, Yahweh, Eye Asher Eye. So when Jesus, we go back to the context we're in, Jesus is saying this to the Jews. He's saying, hey, before Abraham was born, I am, he's using the same term, Eye Asher Eye, I am. He was telling the Jews, I am the God who will be with you. And so you can see in a monotheistic world, how is that possible? You can't, you're a human. You cannot be God. And Jesus, ultimately what he was getting at is, yeah, I'm claiming to be God. Look at what it says in John 5, 18. But even he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This was not possible to the Jews. You cannot do it. And So this evoked a response in the Jews, okay? It evoked a response. And what was the response? The response was they picked up stones and they wanted to stone you. Why? Because in this time, when it comes to to uh, a term we would call blasphemy. They thought Jesus was blaspheming, and so he was, he was talking against God, talking about God, and so the punishment for blasphemy was, I'm going to stone you. So they had every right because they thought this, but they just did not understand the deepness, the purpose, the point that Jesus, a human, could be fully God. So they're frustrated. They don't get it. Now, that's what is going on in this situation. Jesus is using these big words that they understand, but they don't believe it. Let's take this all into our context, okay? I feel like I just taught a class, okay? There's that, but let's take it into our context. How does that apply to us? Because here's the deal. You don't stone people, hopefully, right? Hopefully you don't stone people. That would be horrible, and you don't want to do it. But even like culture, I don't know if culture would know what blaspheming means, and that's a sin. And so what is Jesus saying? What does it mean to us in the here and now? And it really comes back to when, when Jesus says, I am, it's describing, he's describing that he is the fullness of God. The fullness of God, in other words, we know God to be omnipotent, full of power. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He is at the beginning. He is the end. We know this about God. Jesus is proclaiming and saying, I am the God who's with you. All that stuff you know about God, hey, guys, that's me too. The fullness of God. And I love the way Paul put it in Colossians. He says this, for God was pleased, and look at this, to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus. All of his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood that was shed on the cross. In other words, so many people, we look at Jesus, and people think he is a, a, he's a great teacher. People think he's a great prophet. People think he just did good things, right? There's so much. And even C.S. Lewis talks about how you either think Jesus was a liar, he was a lunatic, or he's your Lord, right? He can't be all three of those. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. But we see all that, and, and when Jesus says, I am, a yeah, a share, a yeah, I am the God who's with you, he's proclaiming the fullness that absolutely I'm so much more than just being a good teacher. I'm all of that and so much more. I'm eternal. John writes the very first verse of his gospel. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Now that word was is the same word when Jesus says I am. Was and I am are the same word. They come from the same root word, okay? So he's saying I have always been, I am presently now, and I will always be God. The question is for us, like do I believe that? Do you believe that? And if you're a Christ follower, you might go, yeah, well, of course I believe that. I mean, I know Jesus is God. That makes sense. On this side of things, it does make sense. But more importantly, like what is the response to that? Because if you're anything like me, um, sometimes when I pray, I put God in a box. Has anyone ever put God in a box? Uh, I put God in a box, meaning this, is I humanize God. And when I say humanize, I'm not saying, oh, God became Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I humanize God, meaning I give God like my powers. And I say, oh, if I can't do that, then God definitely can't do that. 
Oh, I've never seen God heal cancer yet, so why should I pray for it? Because he's not going to heal it. Oh, God can't help me get this job. I've never, you know, he hasn't helped me in other situations, so why should I pray about this job? And so I give God this human stuff, and I feel like God sometimes is knocking on the door of my heart, and he's saying, Jared, eh, yeah, I share, eh, yeah, I am. I am the beginning and the end. I am the alpha and the omega. I am constant in your life. I am so powerful. I've been here before you were even here. At my name, Yahweh, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that I am Lord. Jared, that's me. And I go, why would I ever put him in that box? And he comes down and he's saying, Jared, trust me. The more you know about God, the more you're able to trust him. And so you may be in this room and it's hard for you to trust God. Through the divorce, you're saying, God, where are you? And he's saying, I am. Through you trying to find a job, maybe you've been laid off for months and you're saying, God, when am I going to get a job? He's saying, trust me. I am. If you're trying to figure out how to parent your kids, I am. If you're struggling with the idea of, of tithing and being generous, he's saying, I get it. I am. Trust me. Right. Trust me. When Jesus says, I am, he's saying, yes, I'm eternal. Right? He's, he's saying, this is my identity. This is who I am. But that word is also a verb. Uh, and he's proclaiming, here's what I actually do too. Jesus is not only eternal, but he is dependable in your life. Psalm 39 says, but now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. My question for you is, is your hope in Jesus? Like, do you, do you see the bigness of him? The fullness of God is in Jesus. Uh, this past week, I get to lead a, a DYP, a Discovering Your Life Group, uh, or Discovering Your Pathway Life Group, and you heard Chris's story. He began in a DYP, and if you're always looking for a great place to start when it comes to a life group, DYP is a great place to start. Just because, you know, one, who we are as a church, but then simple steps, like almost the basics of how do you grow in your faith that any of us, no matter where you're at in your faith, you can learn and grow from it. But in our DYP this past week, we were talking about how to become more Christ-like, and someone brought up in this discussion that, that they have been in a new job for the past couple of years, and it's been difficult. It hasn't been their favorite job. How many of you guys have ever gone to a new job and you don't like the new job? Okay, yes, it's okay. We all do that, okay? And you, and you go to new jobs, and then once they said that, someone else in the group said, yeah, we're in the same place. We, we are, I'm in a new job, and it's frustrating. I don't like it. I'm hoping I get a new job, but, and this is where they started talking. They said, however, in the midst of this confusion and uncomfortableness, I have found comfort in who Jesus is because I know that he's trying to teach me something. He's dependable when you feel like everything else is not dependable. And it was a great conversation we had, and it reminded me, yeah, sometimes we can get so comfortable that it's just easy to go through the motions, and it's only in the uncomfortable times when you're supposed to, and, and even more so, you're able to trust in who God is. When you know him more, you're able to trust in him, and you understand this as well, that he is reliable when life is unreliable. You may know this. Life is unreliable. Guess what? The people sitting next to you are probably going to let you down. Guess what? Pastors are going to let you down. Guess what? Your job's going to let you down. Your kids are going to let you down. All these people are going to let you down. That's life. We're human. He is reliable. Eh, yeah, I share. Eh, yeah, I am the God who is with you. He is reliable. He is constant when life is full of change. I hate change. He will never change. He is available when everyone else in your world seems like they're unavailable. When you feel like everyone has kind of shunned you or they canceled you and they let you go, he's like, I'm still here. I am Jared. And he has a long-term investment when things are fleeting because we live in a culture where things are just going crazy. He's saying, among this change, a yeah, I share, a yeah, I am the God who is with you. Do you believe in that? And one, what is your response to it? What is your response? It's not just a noun. Jesus wasn't just saying, yeah, I am that God. No, he's saying, that is my identity, but this is what I'm going to do for you. What I love about I am, Yahweh, a yeah, a share, a yeah, I am signifies that God has done everything possible to come near to us by sending his son, Jesus. And his son is not just a human, but he is fully God, fully man. And he has come near to us to experience what you've gone through, to see the frustration in your life. And he said, I've been there. I've seen it. I am here. I've sent my son. I've done everything possible to draw close to you. 
He's done everything except make you love him. He's done everything except make you love him. And the picture I get in my head is, is God, one, knocking on the door. He puts the key in it, scrapes the wood door against the brick, takes two steps in, bends down, and he'll stand here forever. His, his quads are going to burn. His hamstrings are going to be on fire. His arms are going to be like, ah, my triceps. Right. He's sitting here. And he's just waiting for the response. Dad! But he can't make you do that. And he says, I am. A yeah, I share a yeah. I am the God who's with you. What's the response? Like when you hear that, when Jesus says, I am, you may know it, but what are you doing about it? Like what does that evoke in your life? We see two responses in this passage. The first response is that some people, they're, they're mad at God. You cannot be God. That's not possible. We believe in the one true God, and you're saying you're God? You can't do that. Stone him, right? And so they're mad at him. They're about to, they're about to kill him in that moment. And so maybe you're in this room, and you're mad at God. Can't tell you this? That's okay. No one said life was gonna be hunky dory. You can be mad at God, and I always tell this to people God wears his big boy pants, he can handle your stuff. <laughs> he can handle it. Because guess what? He was here before you. You're not the first person who's been mad at him. You're not gonna be the last person that has been mad at him. The question is, what are you doing to draw closer to him? Like, don't just sit in the frustration. Because when you sit in the frustration, like me when I was walking home, like the keys, was, there was sometimes there's little things that'll happen in your life. When you sit in the frustration, they're going to take you over the edge, and you're just going to go, of course that would happen, God, of course. What are you doing to get over that? So you may be mad at God, and that's okay. But if you look, there's another response that happens in this. And if you look back in verse 30, even as Jesus spoke beforehand, there were people there that they believed in him. Do you, do you believe when Jesus says, I am a yeah, a share a yeah, Yahweh, do you believe that he is who he says he is? Because like I said, he's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. Do you believe in him? Now, that word believe, as I look at it right now, believe has kind of gotten watered down in our culture that everyone believes in everything these days. I mean, you could believe in whatever, and you say, yeah, I believe that. And believe has almost become more of just a head knowledge and less of an action. And so believe here is believing in him means experiencing on a daily basis God's grace in your life that you're not perfect, you're not going to be perfect. And when you experience God's grace in your life, you allow his grace to transform us from the inside out. It's not about doing things to receive it. It's about receiving the grace to go do it. And so do you believe it? Which is why Jesus keeps going in the passage. He says, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, right, this, if you hold to my teaching, if you dive into this, not because I'm telling you to and forcing you to, because I can't tell you to and force you to do anything, but have you allowed God's grace in your life and you've wanted to know more about who he is because the more you know about him, the more you're able to trust him in every situation that you go through. He's saying, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So there's two responses in this passage. What is your response? Now, maybe you're in this room, and you've been a Christ follower for years, and to you, like, you've heard this, and you know this, and maybe you've even studied this, which is awesome. My challenge to all of us, and this is even including myself as I've been studying this, was what is my next step still? Like, what is my next step? Yeah, even though I've been a Christ follower for years, I still can grow. I don't ever want to stay stagnant. And if I ever am, like, slap me upside the face and say, Jared, you're staying stagnant, right? Challenge me in that. I, I, want, I need that. We all need that. What is your next step? And so maybe for you, if, this is, if you've been a Christ follower for years, maybe instead of just coming to church, it's like you inviting that neighbor who you've been building a relationship with. And as we lead up to Easter, you invite them to church. Maybe that's scary for you. That's okay. He wants us to get out of our comfort zone. Or maybe wherever you're at, you just struggle with a daily devotional life, which is, if you didn't know, Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday, the 6th. 
Uh, and that actually begins Lent. And so we, we talked about this, I think, last week. But we have a Lent devotional that we're going to go through together as a church. I would encourage you and challenge you to go through that as well. And so what does that look like for you? Maybe you dive into it. You can go to newbreak.church slash Lent and download that. Uh, but I challenge you to do it on Wednesday as you go through. Or maybe it's fasting. Or maybe it's evaluating your life. And, and look, do you see the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Do you see love? Do you see joy with your kids? Do you see do you have peace that surpasses all understanding? That only comes from God. And so would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice for me. Thank you for coming down and showing us what it looks like to be fully God. God, to set the example before us of what it looks like to serve other people. And most importantly, God, you came to sacrifice your entire life. Why? So I could begin my life with you, that through one man, sin entered the world, but through another man, we're able to have a relationship, there's salvation because of it, and that's you, Jesus. And so God, forgive us, forgive me for the times when I think this world is about me. God, forgive me for the sin, God, that leads to death. But God, I want to have eternal life. I want to live my life for you. And so come into my life. God, change me from the inside out. God, I pray that, that your grace, I would get to experience that every single day. Help me to be loving, to be joyful, to have peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control as I move forward, God. I want to grow and know more about who you are. And so I love you, and thanks for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray, everybody said. Amen. Can we give it up for the people that raised their hand today? Amazing decision that you get to make. And so I want to encourage you, for, the, for you who raised your hand, like, you can't live life alone. <laughs> Even superheroes, we need sidekicks. We need people in our life who will help us. We need to get involved in life group. We can't just do it by ourselves. And so head out. If that was you, you, you made that decision. Head out to the white banner that's out here. Uh, we want to give you a Bible if you don't have a Bible. And we want to answer any questions and resource you in any way possible. Man, it's a great decision that you get to make. That Jesus, I am. A yeah, a share, a yeah. The God who's with you. He's going to be with you always. So trust in him um, as you go. Um, before we head out today, uh, we're going to end our time. It's kind of sad and um, exciting all at the same time. But I'm going to invite... Mackie up here. Um, everyone say hi to Mackie. Hi, hi Mackie. <laughs> we, uh, first service was like, oh, Mackie's our student director. Uh, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't heard, Mackie accepted a, an amazing position out in Ohio uh, to be a creative arts director and a student director out there at one of his good buddies' church. And so we're excited for him. I'm super bummed. Yeah, you can clap it up for him. Um, so... I'm excited for him and all that God is going to do in his life. He's an amazing man of God. If you haven't got to know Mackie, uh, one, the funniest man I've ever met in my entire life, but two, uh, he has made such a huge impact uh, here at our campus and Newbreak in general, uh, and so I'm excited for this next chapter, really, in his life. But Mackie, I want to tell you that I'm proud of you, and the fact that we have got to serve together and be on a team together um, isn't just a job. Like I enjoyed coming to work and to serve with you and the impact you made on these students and the leaders and this church and Scripps Ranch High and Marshall Middle School. Like you have done so much. And so I'm excited to see what God is going to do while I'm sad that you're not here anymore. Uh, I know that the church is, is bigger than just New Break. And so uh, I believe that you're going to do so much out in Ohio. And so I'm proud of you and I'm excited for you. And so um, we're going to pray for him afterwards. You can stretch your hands in a second. And we're going to pray for him. Make sure you like squeeze the living daylights out of him. Okay. Give him the biggest hug you've ever seen. Okay. And he loves it. Okay. I promise you. He actually, he really does love it. But uh, let me pray for us as we head out. And we're going to pray for Mackie. And like I said, uh, this is his final Sunday with us. And then Tuesday is his final Tuesday with our students. And we're going to throw him a big party, etc. But uh, would you stretch out your hands? And we're going to pray for Mackie, and we'll send him off, and I'll pray for us as we leave as well. God, thank you for Mackie. God, the example that uh, he is, um, we know that he is following you with all of his heart. And as you lead him and guide him throughout different chapters and different stages, God, I pray that he'd continually give you the pen, that you would continually write this story in his life. And thank you for the impact he has made in students here, God, the impact he has made in my life and uh, my family's life. God, I know that uh, this is not just goodbye, but it's, it's see you later. And so we're excited to see all that you're going to do in his life for your church, God not just New York, but your church, that people would know who you are through Mackie, God. So use him in incredible ways. God, and as we leave today, I pray that you would challenge us and encourage us to take our next step in understanding, one, the fullness of your son, Jesus. Uh, and as we go into our workplace, God, that we would see the big picture that it's no longer about us, but it's about like, sharing the story that you've placed in our hearts with other people, God. And so as we leave today, God, I pray that you do amazing work in our life. Uh, I pray that you bring the son back. In Jesus' name we pray, everybody said. Amen. Uh, so give Mackie a giant hug. But if you need prayer for anything, we'd love to pray with you. But we'll see you guys next week. Uh, make sure you give Mackie the biggest hug possible. Okay? God bless you guys.